Yep, we're good. Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about political institutions and government effectiveness. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, outline what I regard to be some of the major issues in, in the research program I've been engaged in, but also relating it to the larger research program that IGC is involved in, in particular in relation to its work on state effectiveness. Um, so what I want to talk about really are um, political institutions. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to try and steer away a little bit from the conventional way of looking at this, uh, which is contrasting democratic institutions and autocratic institutions. Um, my preference, my strong preference, is to look at it through thinking about two kinds of political institutions uh, and why they matter. The first of these are broadly what I call institutions for constraining power. In other words, given that somebody for, from by some means is occupying a key position in government, a chief executive, or a minister, or whatever we choose to take as our core example, the question is what kinds of constraints that individual faces and how those constraints are enforced. Um, so, so political institutions will shape that. They, they shape the rules according to which individuals have to, um, have to uh, um, uh, get... Um, cooperation for what they're doing. So for example, a prime minister is typically beholden to uh, parliamentary oversight, so major legislation has to be passed through a parliament, so in effect the, the parliament becomes a, a constraining institution. The second category are institutions for acquiring and maintaining power. So in other words, individuals get into positions of responsibility according to certain rules. Uh, again, the sort of stylized democratic view of the world, it would be that they acquire that power through winning a, an election. They then face periodic re-election as a basis for continuing to hold power. So institutions are also important in defining the rules for acquiring and maintaining power. And those institutions can be more or less formal, I've written down um, and clearly understood, or they can be things which have a certain amount of informal um, norm-driven um, uh, uh, components. Uh, and in particular, when you get to certain forms of government, um, military dictatorship, the rules are almost never written down. They are the things that evolve as part of custom and practice as opposed to um, being formal um, uh, political institutions. So I want to talk about that, and I want to talk about why it matters, and how we now, a, a way of thinking about how we how this matters for the for government effectiveness. The second theme I want to talk about today is broadly what I'll call the architecture of government. Um, uh, in particular, I, uh, I've for a long time been interested in how we structure the, the institutions of government, um, how we carve out responsibility on different, on different spheres of government. Um, so for example, take the central banks, to what extent are central banks um, independent or um, uh, um, governed by uh, the polit politicians. Um, and I, I want to think of four broad dimensions of government architecture, which I think are interesting. One is the extent of autonomy of different branches of government. The second is the extent of competition um, between branches of government, which might seem odd since we often think of government as a monopoly, but I'll come to that later. The third is the rules for accountability for autonomous uh, institutions or independent institutions. And finally, the degree of decentralization of power um, within those institutions. So I want to talk about forward, those aren't all, all the dimensions of government architecture one might want to, to talk about, but those are the ones I'm going to talk about um, today. Um, and I, I, my argument is going to be that when we're thinking about the government effectiveness, these are four quite important ideas and of course one has to put flesh on those bones but, but that's really what I'm uh, going to talk about later. And then finally I want to talk about sort of political institutions in context. I think um, some, some uh, um, uh, economists will tend to, um, if you want to, want to, to extract from context, meaning that if you're going to write down formal rules for the operation of a political system and wonder how that impinges on the economy, one can sort of do that without worrying about complicating ideas like social norms and culture and uh, or why history might matter. So some political institutions may work better or worse in 
particular context because of either some form of hysteresis or some form of uh, non-driven behavior. And uh, I'm personally coming um, increasingly to the view that these are important aspects of how we think about um, appropriate political institutions in, in certain contexts. So that's the broad outline of what I, what I want to talk about um, today. So let me come to, back to, blo to political institutions in their, in, in their broadest sense. Um, and I, I've come to think that categories like autocracy and democracy are not particularly helpful categories for thinking about government effectiveness. Um, we observe some, again, from an economic point of view, uh, maybe not a, a complete societal point of view, but certainly from an economic point of view, some pretty effective um, autocratic regimes and some pretty ineffective democratic regimes. So even for a kind of cut on the data of how we think about um, what makes government more or less effective, I doubt that the autocracy democracy labels are particularly helpful. Um, I think they also are too imprecise as a way of thinking about um, what really matters, in my view, in, in government is how governments create an enabling context for um, the economy to operate. So I, don't, I, I think it's a kind of conceptual level. Um, when someone says to me, such and such a country is, is a democracy, um, I'm not sure without kind of drilling down a bit into the kinds of particular institutional arrangements, um, it, it's a particularly helpful way of thinking. So I, 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 I want to sort of set that common way of looking at the world a little bit to one side. The two things, though, that I think repeatedly come up as the kind of two criteria or the two things that make government more or less effective are um, selection and incentives. Selection being um, trying to think about um, should we care who holds power? Now, economists, particularly sort of the what I call, for want of a better term, the traditional public choice view uh, in political economy, have taken quite an extreme stance on at least some aspects of selection, meaning that the notion is that you know, pe people are broadly homo economicus, they're self-interested uh, and, and, and kind of that, that sort of universal truth about human nature the world round, and we should sort of take that as given and we shouldn't try and second guess motivation, we should sort of stick with a very um, vanilla flavoured view of motivation. And so um, Selection would play a much smaller role in that world because if everybody's essentially the same deep down, then the question of whether or not you select one person or another to make um, political decisions or government decisions wouldn't really be a, a major concern. Now, I happen not to think this is a particularly helpful place to start, and you can think of the kinds of selection that might matter for government effectiveness, selection on competence being an obvious one, um, selection on honesty, a lot of decisions that um, get made by politicians. Um, a, a, uh, some amount of honesty would certainly be uh, important. And then to what extent are politicians purpose-driven or mission-driven agents who pursue particular agendas quite far ahead of what might be thought narrow, of at least narrow self-interest? I don't want to get into some deeper question of how far a particular apparently pro-social agenda could just be a reflection of, of personal intent. but. The fact is that it's a, often um, we have to accept and acknowledge that um, individuals may have very different views of the kinds of societies they want to create in, through their tenure of public office, and, and that's part of what we should be concerned with when we think about selection. Now, of course, when you think about selection, the historical context is sort of interesting, namely the extent to which um, political selection is in part um, driven by elites who belong to particular dynasties. And one thing that we found, and I, I, I know there's some relevant research on this for Pakistan, is that uh, some, form, some political um, uh, systems are highly dynastic, tending to select individuals from um, particular social groupings that for one historical reason or another um, have um, um, some hold on political power. So. The historical context or the cultural and historical context can be quite interesting from a political selection point of view. And one thing we see actually when you begin to look at this in the data is even in systems that basically use elections as their method of selection, there can be quite a lot of um, use of political networks, 
which could be just dynastic networks or could be other forms of political networks for um, holding power. So if you care, if you think selection could be important, then uh, these issues could could uh, be something that one cared about in terms of saying, um, is government going to be more effective or not? Well, that's going to depend on the kinds of purpose-driven individuals who, who hold public office, their honesty and their competence. Now, in, once, once you buy into the idea that selection could be an important cut on um, uh, uh, what matters about political institutions and what matters to government effectiveness, there's a question of to what extent one wants to refresh or re-engineer, maybe is a better term, the political class. Um, and we do observe um, some attempts to, for example, have quotas. Um, in, in India, there's been quotas both for women and for, um, and for low caste groups. Um, uh, gender quotas actually now are, are, are found in various, m many different political contexts. Um, and to what extent there's a kind of case for what you might call competition policy to try and open up the political process to new entrants, to individuals who for one reason or another aren't part of the politically favoured networks, and the extent to which you could encourage that through redesign of institutions, make it easier for individuals to stand for office, um, to gain kinds of support. So, so some, some aspects of campaign finance reform could, could certainly be part of, part of that. But selection, I think, is an important uh, issue. The second issue which I think is important when thinking about the role of political institutions um, is perhaps much more meat and drink to economists, and that's incentives. Um, now, there's many aspects to incentives, and I'm not going to cover that here. Um, one I've already sort of touched on when I talked about institutions that constrain um, uh, uh, politicians in particular, or, or any, any executives within a government context, and those are um, uh, legislatures. So to what extent are the incentives in place for legislators to exercise that constraining authority? And to what extent are the, does that enhance the incentives of those who are making the key judgments and decisions to improve the quality of policy? Um, another important area I think where incentives need to be thought through is um, in strengthening the rule of law. Is the judicial system um, appropriately incentivized. And I don't mean at this point um, necessarily explicit monetary incentives, but career enhancement incentives. Are, are individuals' career concerns aligned with the public interest? If Are judges removed for making politically controversial decisions, or are they rewarded for their independence? So these, these are important issues. And um, so I think incentives are, are pretty important in understanding how the institutional structure functions. The other area where I think ultimately it's a big question of in incentives and, and, and through, which runs throughout the whole political system is um, incentives for what you might call broad-based um, policies. Namely, if you ask me sort of for a sort of one-liner on what the most important um, issue in all of government effectiveness is, if it's government effectiveness this is going to serve a, a broad, a, a serve a, uh, to to enhance the economy. It's what makes government do things according to broad-based criteria, namely the kind of thing that if we were doing as economists a kind of analysis is would pass some consistent and well-defined cost-benefit test, rather than figuring out what would be the interest in uh, the, the, the interest of some narrowly defined group. So it's trying to get, as far as possible, a broad-based evaluation of what's good for the economy and then trying to get policies in place that satisfy those broad-based criteria of the kind that a typical cost-benefit analysis would, would come up with. And making the political system wake up and respond to that seems to me to be a very first-order question in, 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 in creating a center, incentives for, for government. Now, why, why does all of this matter for economics, um, and why I think in the sort of modern uh, uh, view of economics, we now have a much more central role for the political institutions and the way they function uh, than we used to. And I think it's because no, one one obvious reason, which I just alluded to, I think, is that you get better policy making 
Um, and, and that can be policy making, not just in the kind of cost benefit terms, but also responding to shocks and other things that you want governments to do. So better policy making is certainly one reason um, to think that effective um, or good, the right kinds of incentives and selection of political institutions matter. But another another view, which I've, I'm not going to go to in, into in too much detail, but has been certainly something I've developed in quite a lot of my own recent work, is the way in which um, having the institutional framework right, getting selection incentives right, um, leads to um, better state capacities. So these are more long-term um, investments in state effectiveness, things that mean that the government um, has within it the right kinds of capital stocks, or whatever term, that allow it to deliver its functions effectively. And you know, we, we uh, in my work with, with Torsten Pearson on this, we have a kind of a, a four-pronged view of what those state capacities are, um, one of which is very traditional, and that's investment in physical infrastructure. And to some extent, that was always recognized, that to the extent that government um, is needed to provide infrastructure because it's a public good, then there's a strong role for government in, in, in that regard. But we have sort of three other dimensions, one of which is um, fiscal capacity, um, having governments uh, invest in the tax base in reforms to both broaden and uh, improve administration of tax bases. Second is what we call legal capacity, which is... Um, Again, things which I think in the sort of modern development view get very central um, billing, and they include things like protection of property rights and effective regulation. And then finally, there's what we're, we're now calling collective capacity, meaning the set of things that allow governments to deliver broad-based um, programs, healthcare, education, um, would be obviously two major examples. Uh, and, 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 and I think... Not just the sort of so 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 what what's important about this perspective is effective institutions aren't just about getting good policy in the short term, but it's also about building a, a strong and effective government in the long term through making sure that governments take a forward looking view of what it is they need to invest in both physical and human assets to mean that the government itself is a more effective entity in the way it deals with the economy now I'm going to just give you two. Um, examples um, to illustrate this. The, fir the first one is one I like I like to look at, and I'm not going to have time to go into it. I, I could talk for hours about this picture, but I'm not going to. And that's um, the sort of notion that different political institutions um, re respond to shocks uh, differently. What, what, what I've got on this uh, chart here is simply a, um, a kernel density of... Um, uh, uh, economic shocks as seen through the lens of um, GDP. Um, and effectively, I've plotted this separately for two sub-samples of countries. Um, the uh, red line is for the countries that do not have strong executive constraints. So those are countries that, according to the Polity 4 database, are not putting in strong constraints on government behavior. So no parliamentary oversight, maybe limited judicial oversight. Um, Whereas the blue uh, line is for the countries that have strong executive constraints. And one thing you'll notice from there is that the distribution for the weak executive constraints is much, it looks much riskier. In other words, there's much more weight in the tails. What that's telling us is that countries um, that, are, um, that have weak executive constraints actually tend to be at the high and the low performing end of the spectrum. Um, so there are countries, I guess, in modern day, it might be China, for example, that is performing very well in an environment with weak executive constraints. But then there are countries at the bottom um, that have weak executive constraints and are performing very badly. So the way I, I, want, I would think about this, if I had time to elaborate the argument, is that this is really a reflection of how government is responding to and managing shocks, um, and, and, and therefore that it's much riskier from an economic point of view to be in a in a, in a uh, world of weak executive constraints compared to strong executive constraints. Um, and so the political institutions really matter, not just to the average level of performance, but more importantly, to the variability of performance. The second chart is on state capacities, which takes up on my second my point just now and comes from a piece that Torsten and I are publishing in the annual reviews very shortly. Um, I hope you can see the different colored dots. 
Um, so what this is is our attempt at a three-dimensional picture for three aspects of state capacity. So what we're measuring on the uh, vertical axis is legal capacity, which is essentially a measure of property rights um, protection. What we're measuring on the horizontal axis is um, on, on, the, on the near horizontal axis uh, is a measure of state capacity, fiscal capacity. So the share of taxation in GDP, and what we're measuring on the um, uh, uh, far on the sort of axis moving away from you is our measure of collective capacity, which is essentially a measure of life expectancy and um, and education. And what you see from this picture, so we have three groups of countries. We have the red dots, which are the rich countries, the blue dots, which are the poor countries, and then the hollow dots, which are the, um, the middle-income countries, that you see a very strongly correlated pattern between economic development and state capacities. Now, one thing we found in our work is when you drill down and look at the incentives and the empirical regulators with respect to political institutions, there's a strong story, very consistent with what I told you just now about the importance of state capacities as a sort of intermediary step between political institutions and outcomes. Okay, um, let me now talk just um, in the last few minutes uh, about the architecture of government. Um, in particular, as I, I know that, that many of these issues are, are important among the researchers going on in, in Pakistan right now, and uh, some of our uh, researchers are uh, worried about this for a while. So I, mean, I want to talk about, to begin with, the role of autonomous institutions. Um, central banks, courts, regulators. Um, I think there's a sort of link to the importance and the role of autonomous institutions in setting them up and the creation of state capacity. So for example, independent central banks often have strong incentives because they're autonomous and independent to build greater competence towards the functions that they face. So one interesting set of issues is how we get autonomous institutions to invest in their own capacities. Is that something that follows from them having that autonomy, or is, uh, is it important to get their mission or charter clearly defined? I actually do think that's important. If you're going to create independence, you also have to create it around a mission. Another issue with autonomous institutions is how you achieve accountability. I mean, one can't, I mean, one wants to take it sort of outside the political process to a degree, but one also wants to achieve accountability. But I think the selection processes to holding office in autonomous institutions is an incredibly important issue and one that applies in a, in, a, in a wide range of situations. Then the second aspect of architecture I want to talk about is competition. As I said earlier, um, a lot of people think, well, you know, government, you know, one doesn't think about competition necessarily alongside government. And of course, one does when one's been thinking about decentralization. Um, and uh, you know, if you're going to have decentralized or devolved government, naturally, the question naturally arises as to whether or not having one government perform better or another, or having one government having an incentive to perform better or another, how important that issue is. And there are different forms of competition. Um, one that I think is quite important, um, and some early work on, on this, is on yardstick competition. To what extent do you try and actually create information on the comparative performance of governments and use that as a basis in a way to incentivize government? So yardstick competition could be important. And, in a framework for making decentralized government work better. The question of how far you both monitor and publicize government performance as part of a, uh, a way of encouraging a certain kind of competition is, 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 is an interesting issue, and I think one that needs to be discussed more in, in, when we're thinking about the architecture of government. Of course, a traditional view, perhaps more traditional view of competition, is its mobility that drives that, but namely one better performing area um, therefore attracts either human or physical capital or, or, or resources because it's a more effectively performing area. And of course, decentralization can, part of decentralization is to foster that kind of intergovernmental competition. Another reason to decentralize, which I don't think is directly to do with competition but is related to it, is experimentation. To what extent, um, I mean, in a way, there's an old sort of Schumpeterian argument applied to firms is that. Um, uh, is that that, that encourages in, um, incentives to innovate. Um, and if, uh, in the case of, of, of government too, maybe decentralization, and one of the strongest arguments of decentralization may be in some contexts is to encourage innovation. Maybe 
it's also decentralization can also be important because of career concerns. And I know Roger Meyerson actually in, in a number of contexts has argued that one of the reasons to have a more decentralized government structure is to create uh, the possibility that successful local politicians can become national politicians and to create a kind of filtering process. So you're engaged in a form of political competition at the local level to achieve national office. So competition is important too. And then finally, I think um, state capacities at the local level can be important as well. And, and, and that's not something that is often or always thought about. So let me return to, 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 to one topic before I close. And that's the topic I mentioned up front, which is norms and culture. Um, now, uh, anyone who was sort of schooled in traditional economics will have learned to be instinctively nervous about the time, any time anyone raises these issues in an economic context. Um, but actually, I think we're, we're perhaps on a transition path to a place where that's less true, of course. There will always be a spectrum of views and different opinions, and people will take these things seriously to different degrees. But um, I think in the, in, when we're thinking about the operation of political institutions, um, the way to sort of put it into a sort of economic framework is to say that the kinds of contractual forms we see are highly incomplete. In other words, we leave huge amounts of discretion to actors to make choices on our behalf that are not contractually obliged. I mean, politics is perhaps the most extreme version of that, that we, we don't contract with our politicians in any formal sense to deliver anything. All we do is we periodically, in, a, in a, at least a system with elections, is we subject them to um, an electoral test, namely will they be re-elected or, or not. In that context, um, a lot of what happens may really turn out to just evolve around the norms that people adhere to. Are those norms norms of public service, norms of self-interest? These are things that could be tremendously important in guiding behavior. Um, and those norms can interact with, with incentives in important ways. So, so one key issue is how far the citizens demand high levels of performance from their politicians. There's a world in which social norms could be such that nobody expects anything and nothing is delivered. That's kind of a norms-driven outcome in which, which effectively we don't get, no one gets what they want, but they don't believe they can get better. And one very interesting question is how you shift the system from one situation to another. Now, traditional view is you can only do that with institutional change. I think I'm very open to the idea that trying to shift norms, and, and one thing I think we'll learn quite a bit um, from some kinds of uh, laboratory experiments is how to get people uh, shifting their norms. And it's an area where obviously psychologists and sociologists and economists can have a productive conversation. But I think as part of understanding government effectiveness, as part of understanding how institutions work, I think we'd be sort of remiss if we didn't get into some of those questions about what drives uh, norms in, in government performance. Okay, so finally to the research program. Um, it's fine to, as I've done so far, to sort of talk about big picture issues, but actually the real agenda is to get beyond the big picture and into the real nitty gritty of the research questions. And, uh, uh, and, and I, I know that's what you're all about and that's what the IGC is about. But uh, So, so the, the, the agenda is going to be specific both to country and issue, and, uh, and I think that's exactly how it should be. Um, but I think one needs to sort of, for any context in trying to bring this to a particular um, context, one needs to begin with a, a really clearly defined notion of, of what are the barriers to effective government. Are they simply that the institutions are failing, meaning that the, the, the wrong rules of the game? Is it a problem that the institutions in principle could work better, but the norms or the cultural values which, in which those institutions are operative are the problem? I think one has to begin with a sort of hard-headed diagnosis or, or is it simply that the state capacities have not evolved to make those institutions flourish? So, so I think there's a whole set of questions around di diagnosis that are key. When we get to sort of micro-research, where I think a lot of the progress is going to come and is coming, then it's down to getting inside specific organizations, be it in tax collection, or, uh, administration, or schools. And I know, again, that the, the IGC has been doing important work in Pakistan on, for example, tax administration. Um, and, 
this is where really um, getting into the, 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 the micro of selection and incentives becomes really important. Uh, to what extent are the incentive structures in place those that are going to make the organization function effectively? Is it a selection problem? Maybe it's just that you're not selecting the right kinds of people to do these tasks. Um, I think they're the absolute um, important questions. Now there's another sort of side to this, which I think is, again, something that IGC has to think hard about, and that's how you convey potentially lessons from international experience. How far it is the case that observing that something worked in other, some other context allows you to have some portable account of that that you can then bring to bear. And I, th I, think, I think for that to work ultimately, it will, you really do need a, a clearly defined conceptual framework which allows you to, to say, you know, what was it about incentives that work and, and what was it about the institutional rules that work? To have any chance because what's clear is you cannot run some regression and estimate some reduced form coefficient um, and then um, project that in any meaningful way onto another context unless you have an underlying conceptual framework for where it is that effect came from what was the mechanism that drove that effect so really in the sort of micro research program which is where everything where the action really is that's that's the the, the challenge not just to describe that something did work or it changed something by X percent, but to have a clear-headed and well-defined account of the mechanism by which that happened. So I've, I've spoken in quite broad terms, um, but hopefully it helps to set the scene for some of the discussions that you're having there. And apologies again that I can't be there in person to participate in those, but if the technology allows, we'll have a Q&A &A at this point. Thank you very much.